I tell you what, amen, if we could just live all that singing right there, we'd be good. It ain't just a song, amen. It's a Savior. We sing it about Him, amen. Boy, and He sure is worthy. You know, young people singing like that, amen, just live it. Man, just live it. You do exactly what you were singing. I'm telling you what, God will do more than you can ask or think, amen. That's good. Well, I'm glad he's my Savior. Mm. I'm glad he found me. I'm glad he's able, amen. John chapter number 10, what a great chapter. Amongst all kinds of great chapters, amen. <laughs> this whole book's full of great chapters, ain't it? John chapter number 10 has got a lot of truths in it, very practical. John chapter number 10, we'll read, I don't know, we might read the whole chapter, 42 verses, amen, and hopefully it won't feel like the 42 months of the great tribulation period, <laughs> John chapter number 10, look at verse number 1, what's the first word there, the Bible says, verily, verily, I say unto you. He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Well, God's got one way, don't he? Yeah. He said he was that way. Yeah, and the truth and the life. John 14, 6, amen. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You try to make it any other way, you're a thief and a robber. Amen. You ain't making it but one way, and that's through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, but he that entered in by the door, thank God there's a way. Ain't that is a specific entrance. Ain't through a window. Ain't dropped out through a roof like them guys did when they took that boy to Jesus. You ain't coming up through the scutter hole. Amen. There is one way to glory. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to the light. Hey, many people's trying to go all kind of other ways, and it's only through the door. Amen. That is the entrance. The Bible says, He that entered in by the door, verse 2, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Well, he's an interpreter of the parable, ain't he? The Bible said, all that in, uh, ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall, shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for the steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and, they, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I say amen right there. Yeah, amen. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and care not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Amen. And another sheep I have, which are not of this fold. There's a lot of practical application to you and I in those first verses, but boy, this other sheep, that's you and I, amen which are not of the fo this fold. Even also, I, I, I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. That's putting it all together into one body. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. 
This is God. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. That's why the Bible said he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost. You can't kill God, amen? He voluntarily laid down his life for the sheep. There was a division, therefore, among them, among the Jews, for the, these sayings. And many of them said, He had the devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, uh, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was uh, at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple of Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Boy, God's very plain, ain't he? Amen. You know what the problem is? Most people don't want to know the truth anyhow. Tell us plainly. They didn't want to know. He already told them. Amen. The Bible said in verse 26, But ye believe not, because ye are not my sheep. And as I said unto you, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones against the stone. He said, tell us plain. He made it very plain. They want to kill him. Amen. You find out how bad people really want truth when you give them truth. I want to know the will of God. I want to know what's right. But when you get told you don't like it. Amen. Amen. Hey, he spoke very plainly. The Bible said in verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, For good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said ye are gods. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scriptures cannot be broken, Say ye of him whom the Father have sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. Amen. Brother Ben, how about pray for us tonight, bro? Lord, I thank you for your blessing. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes. Help us with that. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God bless it, Lord. that verse number 15 of this chapter the Bible says as the father knoweth me even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep Jesus of course speaking to this crowd about the knowledge of the father and that his knowledge of the father and that he laid down his life, the Bible said, my life for the sheep. 
I want to look at that phrase tonight, and do a little bit of preaching on a Bible phrase. The phrase is, my life. Now, when I think about Jesus saying, my life, there's a lot I think about his life. And boy, it's all good. What a life, the life of the Savior. But I wonder tonight if we was to take that phrase and I would say, or you would say, my life. If you was to give a brief description of your life, what would it consist of? There's a lot of great things we could say about the life of the Savior, the Good Shepherd, laid down his life for the sheep. Nobody loved us like Jesus and the great singing about him tonight that stirs our heart, amen, how great he is towards us. Well, there's all kind of good things about his life, but what about my life and your life? I mean, we go around the room tonight and you just had to give short paragraph type sermon or testimony of your life, what would your life consist of? My life. Let's look at what our Bibles say about this phrase tonight. Let's see if we can't glean a little truth and maybe allow the Holy Ghost to speak to us about our lives. Look in 1 Kings chapter number 19. My life. You have a life to live. I have a life to live. And more only thing that's going to count is what's lived towards Him. But a lot of times our lives is not about Him. They're more about us. My life. You know, a lot of people say, well, it's my life. I live it how I want. Do you know what? You're exactly right. Amen. You got a right. You live in America. You can do whatever you want for the most part, amen. Matter of fact, you don't even have to live in America. It's your life. You do whatever you want to. Yeah. And people like say, well, I, I don't really care what the church says. I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what God says. Hey, that's your prerogative. But you're making the wrong decision. You, you're going down the wrong path, amen. Hey, the best thing I can do and the best thing you can do is to line up our lives with this book, amen, and follow the Lord, my life. What is our life? You know what I find about our lives? I see Elijah here. You know the great Elijah, the great prophet, the great work of God that he done all through the word of God. But we find Elijah here speaking about his life, amen. Now look what the Bible says in uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 4. He's gone out and he's defeated the prophets of Baal in chapter 18, amen. You know how it works. Now Ahab and Jezebel's kind of reared up and got mad about what's going on. Jezebel's told him he's going to kill him. And the Bible says this in chapter 19 and verse 1, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life. There's that phrase. For I am not better than my fathers. Elijah's speaking to God. He's gone up under his juniper trees, uh, uh, running from a, uh, the words of uh, Jezebel and what she's spoken about, what she's going to do to him. And now he's laid up under his juniper tree. And he said, My life is no good. Why don't you take away my life? Amen. Amen. Look in verse number uh, 10. The Bible says, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Look down to verse number 14. He mentions this phrase three times in this chapter. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You know what the problem is here with Elijah? He's having a pity party. I mean, here's a man that's done a lot of great works for the Lord. You know what? Hey, sometimes in this old life, we all have our pity parties. And you know what we start talking about? My life. Amen. Amen. How I feel, my emotions, how I've been done, how people have treated me. Amen. Hey, you know it's a bad way to live your life in a life of a pity party? Now, I won't talk too bad about Elijah. He's a great man of God. And he's done a lot of great works for the Lord. Amen. Hey, but if you live in this life long enough, hey, there are things going to rise up in your life. Hey, catch you by the heel, maybe hit you right square between the nose and between your eyes, right in the face, and knock you back. And you're going to begin to have a pity party about your life. Amen. Hey, can I see it say about our lives? They should not be spent in a pity party. Amen. Now, all of us are capable of having them. 
and we've had numerous of them and probably going to have some more in the future, but there are some people that their life is a pity party. It ain't like Elijah here just getting uh, thrown up against the wall and things going bad in their lives. All they live is a pity party life. Hey, every time they speak, it's negative. Everything they talk about is how bad they've been treated and how bad their life is. Hey, what a life to live if your life description is a pity party. Do you know your life ought not to be a pity party? Now, I didn't want to beat you too bad tonight. Maybe you're actually going through something right now. And, man, I have no clue what you're going through. But I'm glad God does and he's faithful. And he can come through. And, amen, if you're going through a time right now and maybe you feel like the wind's been knocked out of your sails and uh, a lot of times you're just plugging along, going for the Lord, but at the moment you're having a bad, hard time in your life, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about people that constantly, most of their lives are spent in a pity party life. Hey, there's never any highlights. There's never any good times. Hey, most of everything they talk about is negative. Hey, they're down and out and, and beat up all the time and always want somebody to have sympathy on their life because their life is a pity party. Everybody's doing me wrong. Everybody's beat the, uh, talking about my husband. Everybody's treating my wife wrong. Everybody's doing my youngest wrong. Hey, your life should not be spent in a pity party, Amen. Elijah's having a bad day. We all have bad days. But I'm talking about people that have a bad life. And their life is a pity party life. Hey, we can all have uh, bad days in our lives. But it shouldn't be every day. Now, if your life character seems to be more pity party days than good days, something's not right. If you're always wearing your emotions on your shoulders, hey, you need to put them somewhere else. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Hey, your life doesn't have to be spent in the negative, amen. amen. It doesn't have to be spent with your lip poked out all the time, hating world and hating the life, amen. Hey, God came to give us life and life more abundantly. Amen. Hey, are you saved tonight? Amen. Are you going to heaven? Is your name written down in glory? Amen. Hey, we've got something to rejoice about, amen. You say, but right now I'm having a bad time. Well, Elijah was too. That don't mean it has to be every stinking day of your life. Amen. You know what happens when you're, when you're living this pity party life? Most of the time we find ourselves in the same situation Elijah is right here. And maybe you find yourself like this all the time. If you gave the brief description of your life and you was to stand up tonight and you had the floor and all you had to do is say, oh my. And if you stood up, most people already knew what you was going to say. There's probably something wrong with your life. It shouldn't be a pity party life, amen. Uh, uh, you, know what, you know what happened to Elijah? Amen. What happened to him, amen? Hey, when we get like this, we are usually running from the will of God. You know when you get to the pity party life, hey, most of the time, I'm talking to saved people tonight, that's born again, that are God's children, just like Elijah was here. Hey, amen. You know what the problem was? Elijah was running from the will of God in his life. Hey, God called that man to be a great prophet. He just stood up against the prophets of Baal over there in chapter 18. Hey, defeated them, triumphant over him in glorious fashion. God brought down fire from glory, consumed his sacrifice, and he slew those prophets, and God was using him mightily. And when you get to chapter number 19, he's running away from God. Look in verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth unto Judah, and left his servant there. Hey, when you're living the pity party life, hey, most of the time you examine your life the way we ought to and allow the Holy Ghost to examine us, search us and try us, we probably run it from the will of God. God's people that are sad and defeated, hey, maybe your problem is you're running away from God's will. Maybe the reason why you live in that pity party life is you're trying to get away from what God is calling you to do. You know the best thing we can do is follow God? Yeah, amen. I, I, I firmly believe it, and you are too, too, if you believe the book and you'll follow the Spirit of God, that God will lead you into His will. Amen. And God will speak to your heart. Do you know living the Christian life is an exciting journey if you do it right? Yeah. It's not a pity party thing. It's an adventurous life. I like adventures, don't you? I like seeing what's around the next corner, what's around the next bend. That's the way we ought to live our lives by faith, amen. I'm walking in the light God's giving, but I want to see what he does next. I had two men come to my office tonight speaking to me about something that they believe God's kind of directing in their life. You know what that was to me? That's exciting. Amen. God's putting something on their heart to want to do something for him. 
And both of them's in two different areas, amen, but they revolve around the work of God and God. Hey, man, what an exciting journey to know that God is leading me or possibly directing me to do something for him. Now, why don't you get a hold of the vision, get a hold of what God's doing. Hey, you know what? People perish, they've lost the vision, amen. God's leading you into his will. Maybe the problem is, is why you live in the pity party life is God has already called you into his will, but you're running from it. Now Elijah's running from the will of God. Now he's living the pity party life. You know what? If I examine my life, sometimes when I'm living a pity party life, that's why I find myself as running away from what God wants me to do. What was he doing? He was running away from the will of God. You know what else he was doing when you have a pity party life? Hey, you always make things bigger than what they are. Hey, you listen to people talk about how bad their life is and what's going on, and you're thinking, man, that ain't that bad. And you hate to be too judgmental, too hard on somebody that's really going through something hard. Elijah was facing something he thought was devastating. Take away my life. He's ready to die. And you know what it was? He's run away from the will of God, number one. But number two, he was making things bigger than what they were. Look, you don't believe me? Uh, look in verse number one. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had slain those prophets, right? And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah. Sent somebody to go down and tell him, right? Saying, so let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now, he's done. how many prophets of the Baal was it that he slain back in chapter 18? 850? Stood up with them, triumphed it over him, and one woman ran her mouth, and he ran for his life and ready to die. I mean, one lady, Jezebel, a devil, amen. You know how she is. And you know what the Bible said, and here's what I want you to see. Look at verse 3. And when he saw that, I've showed you this before. You see that? He seen nothing. She spoke it by some messenger. But the Bible said he saw that. You know what he's doing? He's making that thing in his mind bigger than what it is. Do you know why you live in a pity party life? Because you're making more at it than you should. It ain't that big of a deal, man. Hey, hey, put some faith in God like you had yesterday and get up out of that pity party and serve the Lord. We make, we live our, our lives as a pity party because we run from the will of God, number one. But number two, we make things more than what they are. If we just slow down and pray and give that thing to God, the whole hindsight's 20 20 kind of thing. That thing wasn't that big that we tripped us over. But at the moment, it was the biggest thing going on in our lives. Sometimes it is a bloody code, ain't it? That's all it is. Hey, man, he was running from the will of God. He was making things bigger than what they are. Hey, some of you, the reason why you live in pity party life is you make things bigger than what they are. He ain't seen nothing. But he said he did. You know why he's having a pity party? Number three, because he sat down on God. Verse number four, and he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under, under, under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. I mean, you know what he did? He went down there and sat down under that juniper tree. You know the worst thing you can do is sit down on God? But it's rough, preacher. Yeah, press on, amen. It won't be long, songwriter said. I'm telling you, you put one foot in front of another for so long, you'll be out of that trial. Hey, that thing will be in hindsight way back there, amen. It is never good to say, I quit. Yeah, amen. We didn't get into the quit, amen. Hey, Jesus didn't go to Calvary to get to the bottom of the hill. He went to the top and finished the work. Hey, keep pressing on, amen. Hey, get out of that pity party and keep on going, amen. Many people are living defeated because they're sitting down on God, running away from God, amen. Amen. He has, he, he has ran away from God. He's ran out in the wilderness, a bad place to go anyhow. He's going in the wrong direction. That ain't the way to go. And he's leaving all his friends behind. Boy, ain't that just a rest of people disaster? In his mind, he's got this big old trouble of this woman. That's making more of it than what it is. He's running away from the will of God. He's leaving all his faithful friends. He left a servant there. He went all by himself into that wilderness. He's all by himself. He is set down and ready to die. Here it is. I've had enough. What a recipe for disaster. Amen. Is your life spent in a pity party? Verse number five, the Bible said, and he lay, uh, and as he lay down, uh, lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, even an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. You know what? You know what? You know why he's having a pity party? Because he's wild. In in his defense, 
Good possibility why he's worn out because he just done a great work for God in chapter number 18. I mean, the work of God gets kind of tiresome on you. I mean, you're fighting the cohorts of hell. The devil's trying to do all he can to bombard you. He's attacking your mind. He's attacking your spouse. He's attacking your children. He's attacking your church. That's attacking your life. Hey, man, hey, sometimes things do get hard. I mean, in his life, amen, he stood up against the prophets of Baal. I mean, you can't, you can't imagine the satanic attack of 850 going on around him. Now, count the spirits that's in the atmosphere, amen. Hey, it's a, it's a battle, amen. It's kind of like the, the Lord on the, on the cross of Calvary. The Bible said the bulls of Basin can pass him about. It was more than just a mob crying at him. It was more than just throwing uh, thorns in his head and, and, and piercing of his hands and his feet, amen, and the stick in the side. Hey, it was a satanic attack on him, amen. Yeah, amen. It, sometimes it can get overwhelming. Yeah, Devil's not going to lay down and let you serve God. He's not going to let you go sing and live what you sung. He's going to fight. He's not going to let you get up out of the pulpit or preach or be a witness or testify without the devil bombarding your life. Yeah, hey, hey, sometimes we have pity parties because we wore out. Sometimes we just need to take a break. Hey, God doesn't rebuke him here. He says, hey, man, take you some sleep. Here's your little bread. Is you some water to drink? Eat and, eat and sleep, man. Re rejuvenate yourself. Get, get some rest. Amen. Every once in a while, we all need a little re rejuvenating. A little time to sit back and relax. And Yeah, God, I see now and again. I understand. You know what? I'm glad God's merciful. Elijah is having a pity party. He is running from the will of God. He is making things bigger than what they are. He has sat down on God. Amen. Amen. He has run away from all his friends and the things that the comfort that area that God had put him in. And God shows up and doesn't rebuke him one time. He wakes him up and said, Hey, boy, get you something to eat. Well, I'm glad he's compassionate. I'm glad he's long suffering. And God will come by in the midst of our pity parties of our life and say, You know what? It's, it'll be all right. This thing's going to come to pass. And we'll be at it again. Amen. He's all alone. He's away from God, away from his friends, away from his comfort, and God shows up in his life. But you know what? Elijah's a great description of any child of God that goes through some trials in this life, but some people make them more than the norm. Some people's not like Elijah. They're not worn out because they're doing the will of God. They're worn out because they're doing everything against God. They bring a lot of the trouble on themselves. And they live a life of a pity party. God help, we shouldn't live a life of a pity party. Number two, look in Psalms 27. My life. Your life shouldn't be spent in a pity party. If you find yourself living in a pity party all the time, maybe you ought to examine yourself and ask the Lord to help you get up out of that kind of state and mentality. Start living a life that pleases Him. Do you know when you live in a pity party, it just don't affect you. It affects everybody around you. I don't like being around people that's poor mouth and drags you down. And, and, and you act like that and you wonder why nobody wants to be around you. My life. Is your life a pity party? Number two, what is my life? Look at the psalm that says here. Psalms 27. Boy, I like this psalm. The Bible says the Lord is my light. Amen. My salvation. Whom shall I fear? Boy, God's able, ain't he? The Lord is the strength of my life. Can you say that tonight? When it comes to your life, can you say the Lord is my strength? Of whom, uh, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, my enemies, and my foes came uh, upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp uh, against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. And the psalmist is talking about the Lord is his strength. Hey, when the Lord is your strength, amen, and you realize he's your power, you can overcome what you're facing. Look at verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. You see that? To behold the beauty of the Lord in the choir of his temple. Hey, the psalmist is speaking about it in his life. This is David giving a brief description of his life, if you will. He's speaking about the Lord being the strength of his life and that his life might be spent in the house of the Lord all the days of 
my life. Do you know there's coming a day we're going to spend our lives with the Lord in his house? Hey, thank God there's coming a day. Hey, when the Lord steps out of the cloud and calls his children home, hey, we're going to dwell with the Lord in the house of the Lord forever, amen. amen. That's what the psalmist said in Psalms 23. He's going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's glory, man. That's heaven. That's the home we're heading to. But I thank God practically we can still live a life today as the Lord is our strength and dwell among his house and his people. Well, wouldn't that be a good testimony to have? Hey, my life is spent under the strength of the Lord. My life. Could you say what some Psalmist David said? He said this in verse 5, in the time of trouble, when his life, when the Lord is his strength, and he's spending his life with the Lord. Hey, he said, in the time of trouble, because that's going to come. Hey, man, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Hey, man, you make the Lord your life. Hey, man, you spend your life with the Lord. Trouble's going to come. But look what he said here. One thing, he said in verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, and the secret, uh, secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies, round about me therefore will I offer in, the, in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy I will sing yea I will sing praises in the Lord what's, what's the psalmist speaking of David's talking about worshiping the Lord spending time with God hey hey, trust in the Lord and his strength and when his enemies come God comes by to help him he lived that practically he fled from his life from Saul Saul tried to kill him all the days of his life but you know what, you know what David could say in this psalm the Lord is my life he is my strength I spent my time worshiping God and he's been faithful on his side Hey, hey, listen to me, young people. You spend your life with God and trust him for your strength. When the troubles arise, and they will, and the world will persecute you, God will bring you through, amen. amen. That's what he's praising God about. Hey, God is faithful, amen. amen. My life shouldn't be spent at a pity party. My life should be spent under the strength of the Lord, worshiping him, singing his praises, worshiping our God. Verse 7, hear, O Lord, when I cry. With my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou sayest, seek, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. What's the psalmist speaking about? His strength, his redeemer, his lover, his savior. He's worshiping him, he's seeking him. Hey, what a life and a testimony, amen. amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I'd like to take Psalm 27 and say that's my brief description of my life. That'd be a good one to have, man. The Lord's my strength. The Lord's my help. Hey, man, I'm not afraid of a thing. The wicked's coming after me, but God's delivering me. Hey, man, I'm worshiping him. I'm making him my life. I'm worshiping and singing praises unto him, and he's been faithful on his behalf. I'm seeking him. Verse number nine, hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O Lord of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in the plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not uh, over unto, uh, unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses arise risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Man, what a great song. Hey, hey, my life should be consumed in the strength and the worship and praising and seeking our God, and he will be faithful, amen. amen. My life. Well, what a life to live. The Lord is the strength of my life, and one day it will be with him, and until then, then I want to live for him my life. That's a good one, ain't it? Let me give you another one. Psalm, John 13. We're just tracing the phrase, man. John 13. The chain reference went in itself. This cold King James Bible, ain't it? My life. My life shouldn't be spent in a pity party, even though sometimes things arise that may be beset us all. But we should get up and trust the Lord and press on because he's faithful. Hey, we should live a life of realizing he's our strength and worshiping him and serving him and seeking him, and he will always be found faithful. Here's another one. Look in John 13, verse 36. Enter the chapter here. Simon Peter. Brief description here. 
Hey, you kind of don't want to beat Peter too bad, kind of like trying to beat Elijah, you know. Elijah had a hard time. But, man, he's, his good times way outnumbered his bad times. Peter had some bad times in his life, but, man, I'd like to be known as a man that stood up for the Lord like he did. You know, he put his foot in his mouth, but who ain't really never put their foot in the mouth? You know the kind of people that ain't put their foot in their mouth? The ones that don't talk. Amen. Ones that don't try. You know, you, you know who don't make mistakes? I've told you over and over. People don't try. If you try, you're going to make mistakes. If you sing, you're going to mess up. You preach, you're going to make up all kind of words. You know what I mean? Make a dictionary with my name on it. Amen. But you know what? I'd rather go out slinging, man. Doing all I can, giving God what I got. And I'm not making a, uh, an excuse for ignorance and not studying and trying to be better at it. Hey, man, I want to I wanna try to, uh, you know, dress eloquent, you know, and speak proper, hey, man, but sometimes it don't work. But my wife's working on me, so, hey, man, there's hope. She's got the grammar, hey, man, I just ain't got it from her yet. But, uh, you know, I'm not making an excuse for it at all, hey, man. But you know what? If that's all you got, that's all God wants. It's according to what a man hath and not according to that he hath not. I'm not making an excuse for being ignorant and unlearned and not trying to improve him. We ought to all try to be better at everything we do, especially for our God. Sometimes we make it too likely to just be ignorant and go on and say, well, God's in it, let's go. I'm not for that. God's not for that. But you know what? If what you got is what you got, use what you got. And if God wants to make it better, he'll help you make it better. But don't you wait to get it right to do it. That's what Moses' problem was. And the Lord said, hey, go down and tell my favor and let my people go. And he said, boy, I, 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 I can't speak good. He's making excuses, you know. I, I can't do this, and man, I'm going to stumble around. And the Lord said, I called you, go do it. Yeah, amen. I'll be with your mouth. I'll touch you. I'll be with you. Hey, God's not making an excuse for it in ignorance. God's just telling you, I'll be there. I called you. Let's go get it done. Yeah, and when it comes time, hey, man, I, I'll speak if i got to speak or let Aaron speak. Hey, but there'll come a time I'll let you speak yourself. You just step out and do what I want you to do, son. Hey, that's what God wants to do. Hey, live my life serving God my life. He's faithful, ain't he? Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whether thou goest, uh, excuse me, whether goest thou, Jesus answered him, whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. You know, sometimes it ain't God's will right now. He was willing. That's a good thing. Sometimes God just wants to know if you're willing. Kind of like he did with uh, 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 Isaac. Isaac. God just want to know if Abraham was willing. He didn't kill him. He just want to know if you let me take him if, if I asked. God just wants to know if you're willing. Sometimes he'll let you go through with it. He said, hey, it ain't right now, but afterward it will be, Peter. Verse number 37, Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Peter said, here's my life, and it's yours, and I'll lay it down. Jesus said in verse 38, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. We've seen in 1 Kings that some people live their lives as a pity party. Of course, Elijah's wasn't constant. It was just a, you know, things that arise in his life that got him difficult and blindsided him for a little while and he got back up. But our lives shouldn't always be like that. Hey, some people live their lives like David, amen, as he's your strength and serving him until he comes and worshiping and seeking his face and what a life that is to live. But we find some people just like Peter here. The Lord is their life. God has always been with them. But some people talk real good until the hard times come. My life, you know what Peter said, is for you. You know what the Lord said? You're going to deny me thrice before the cock crows. Do you know what? Some people spend their lives talking a good talk, but when it gets rough, it goes out the window. What? That's not a life to live. It's one thing to speak a good, uh, talk a good game, but what about when it, when it gets rough? Can you keep going? Hey Amen. When everything goes against you, will you still press on? Hey Amen. I've seen people all down through my ministry that talk a good game till it hits their house. It, they talk a good talk, hey amen, till it, till it blindsides them. Hey, they can always tell everybody else what they ought to do, but when it hits your home, your life changes. Hey, man, it's one thing to talk a good talk. It's another thing to live the life that you talk, amen. Hey, if you're going to speak it by God's grace, let's live it, amen. Hey, don't let your own brief description of life be a good talk game and no life game. Yeah, amen. 
Some people's lives are pity party. Some people's lives living in the strength and the glory and praising God all the days of their life. And some people, all they do in their life description is they talk the talk, but they never walk the walk. John Wayne said courage. Courage. You know what he said about courage? John Wayne said courage is being scared to death but saddled up anyhow. Hey, man, sometimes it's going to get scary. Hey, scared to death, but saddling up anyhow. Hey, sometimes you just need to get in the saddle, man. Hey, God said, let's go, let's go. I don't know what I'm going to face, and right now I'm really scared, but God, you said that I'm going with you always, amen. even unto the end. Amen. Don't just be a game talker. Be a life liver, amen. Hey, hey many people talk a good talk with their lives, but when the, when the time comes, they give up. Hey, man, Peter spoke very well here, but he didn't live it out. Hey, man, don't be someone that your brief description of life is you've always taught it, but you've never done it. I've seen people, man, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, and they'll never do nothing. But it sounds good. Maybe they even meant well, but they didn't have enough courage to press on. Trust in the Lord. Get in the saddle. Ride out, amen, and see what happens, amen. Look, look in Acts chapter number 20. Let me give you another one. My life. Is your life spent with a talk game? Is your life spent in a pity party? Or maybe your life spent in the strength of the Lord and serving him. Boy, I like this Acts 21, man. Act, you know this one when you see it. This is the apostle Paul over here uh, talking to the elders at Ephesus. His farewell speech to them. Hey, man, speaking about his life. The description here to the people of Ephesus, here's what he said, verse 17, Acts 20. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go in the Spirit, go bound, excuse me, into the, in the Spirit, into Jerusalem, not knowing the things which shall befall me there. Say that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying, that bonds and afflictions abide me. Courage. Scared to death and saddling up. Verse 24, but none of these things move me. Neither count I, here's our phrase, my life. What does the apostle say? There's many things that I'm about to face. The Holy Ghost has revealed it unto me. But neither count I my life dear unto myself. Boy, you want to talk about a description of life that it's not about me? Yeah, amen. <laughs> he, said, he said, neither count I my life dear to myself. He said, he said, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Hey, God has called me to testify of his gospel and none of the things has moved me because I don't count my life dear to myself. It ain't about me. It's about him and his work. What a description of someone's life. Hey, he said, you've known it publicly. I've testified it. I've lived it. Amen. Hey, what a life to live for God, man. Amen. You want to talk about going out with a life in the blaze of glory. Hey, hey, shooting the guns and staring up the dust and rippling up the water. Hey, Paul done it for the glory of God. Amen. That's a life to live. Excitement, man. Hey, where are you going? What's next? Tears, temptations persecution, all of us arising on him, but he said, I counted not my life dear to myself. Yeah, man, that's faith, man. Amen. That's trust in the Lord. He'd been in and out of prison, been out of, in and out of persecution and stone and whip and everything that he went through, but he trusted the Lord because his life was not about himself. It was about God. Yeah, amen. What a life, amen. Look what he goes on to say in verse 25. The Bible said, and now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. He said, man, you ain't going to see me no more, but I want you to know what my life's been about. My life. This is a testimony we should all strive for. 
not to count our lives dear to ourselves, but to give them to the glory of God, testifying of the gospel of the grace of God, the mission mind, if you will, taking the gospel around the world, and whatever God wants to do with my life, let's see what he can do. Step out by faith and watch him. Hey, it ain't got to be in the jungle somewhere. Hey, man, it can be right in your own neighborhood. Going down there to that job, punching that clock, being a witness to those co-workers, coming home and letting your neighbor see you go down to the house of God and worship God and live a clean life across the street and watch God move. Exciting, man. <laughs> hey, to be a part of the work of God. Hey, man, we think, you know, well, the problem is the devil's uh, uh, got a hold of our minds and made us think that our lives are insignificant because we're not way out there where somebody else is. You're going to hear stories about that next week, about way out in the jungle. And, hey, if God wants you in the jungle, boy, that's exactly where you need to be. Hey, man, that's the truth. Hey, man, but God might want you exactly where you're at, just plugging them on and using the resources you got for his glory and watch him work. Man, what a life. We're living such a defeated life thinking, man, oh, I'm not the preacher. <laughs> hey, you want to trade? <laughs> I wouldn't do it, amen, because I know what the Lord's called me to do. I'd be out of the will of God. But you know what? Hey, you're just as important right there where you're at in the pew. Hey, man. Hey, that, you, know, you, know, you know how the devil defeats people to live an up, up and out, in and out, a uh, 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 slack life of going to church because they think their lives are insignificant. Yeah, amen. You know what? Hey, I can't do that. Y'all expect me behind the pulpit every time I come. What if I didn't show up? Well, preacher, you got an important job. You need to be there because people need to hear the message. Hey, your life is just as important where you see it. Hey, man, you never know that that faithfulness on that pew, just very silent as you are and don't speak very much, is stirring somebody's heart to keep plugging along for God. And seeing you press on through the trials you're going through is encouraging them to do what they can do for God. Everybody's important. Don't listen to those lies of the devil. He's a liar in the father of it. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. Hey, man, your life is important. Living for God and watching God do what he can do through your life. I'm watching some right now in this church grow up right before our eyes. And without them in this church, it would not be what it is right now. You said, ain't much of it right now. I think there's much of it. Yeah, amen. I think God's doing a great work, amen. You said, well, we ain't got every pew full. Well, maybe God's got a time. This is all he wants sees we can handle. Right. Amen. Maybe the Lord said, that's all I'm able to pastor. And that's, if that's what he wants, glory be to God. Amen. But that don't mean I ain't striving to fill them all up. And see what he can do, man. Amen. But I'm watching people grow up right before our eyes. Amen. That God's using mightily. Amen. Hey, hey, you are important in the work of God. Amen. Hey, hey, my life and your lives wouldn't be what they were if it weren't for everybody in this place. Amen. You hate to, you know, call names and get the devil jump on somebody's back, you know. So I won't do it, amen. I'm tempted to, but I don't think it's right. But you know, hey, God's using you. I want you to be encouraged, amen. Hey, man, people realize it. Anybody's gotten any discernment see it, sees it, man. And I want you to keep serving the Lord. Hey, man, your life does count. Hey, man, and God's doing great work with you right where you're at. Yeah, amen. You think, I'm not doing much, preacher, and I, you, you'd be surprised what you're doing. Every one of you, you're important. Paul said, hey, hey, I didn't count my life dear to myself. Hey, man, let me give you another. You know, man, it's way late, ain't it? Let's look at this last one, Romans 4, 16. Finally, my brother, <laughs> one more chapter. <laughs> I'll give you one of Apostle Paul closing. Finally, my brother. Sister, you guys, I see you look at your watch. Richie, your wife's looking at his watch, her watch. <laughs> and I'm joking, amen. <laughs> Romans 16, amen. My life. Man, it's, I want you to get a hold of the vision, man. Get a hold of what God's doing. My life. Romans 16, look at this. I commended to you, Phoebe. Hey, you know women are, you women are very important. Our sister, which is a servant. There's that thing again, ain't it? Of the church, which is in Sincera, that you receive her in the Lord as become of saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she have need of you. There's a sister that's a servant. She's very faithful. And he's writing to the church and said, I want you to assist her, whatever she needs, whatever business. For she had been a sucker of many and also of myself. That's a big fancy word for being a helper. 
Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in, the, in Christ Jesus. You say, why didn't you use helper there? Because the Holy Ghost said to use secure or succor. Amen. Look, look, here, here it is, verse 4. Who have for my life. Paul's talking about his life. Look, who for my life lay down their own neck unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Paul's commending these women, these servants of the church, and that others would assist them and help them in the work of God. Priscilla, Aquila, Phoebe, amen. Uh, these, these great saints of God that have done a great work. Paul said they have laid down their life, their necks, for my life. If you was to give a brief description of your life, has your life ever been laid down for somebody else's life? Paul said, my life is what it is because these sisters, these people, Aquila and Priscilla, Phoebe, have laid there in their lives for me. You, you know who gets all the attention? The Apostle Paul. But you know who helped him along the way? Brothers and sisters in Christ that laid down their life on his behalf. Let me just ask you this question. Have you ever or maybe are you, do you desire that your life would be laid down to help somebody else's life? This thing ain't about just me and you. It's about others. And how you could take your life and plug it into somebody else's life to make them a great saint of God for the Lord. These men, these women helped the Apostle Paul. There's people God's putting in your lives. I see God sending people and putting people in lives. I've seen these young people have been coming around late. And you know what God's doing? God's plugging these people in your life so you can lay down your life for their behalf. And you never know what God would do with their life. Don't waste it. My life. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 10, he said, Thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life. He said, You've known it. You know what? Truth be known. People know our lives. Is our lives what they should be for him? My life. Think about it. My life for him. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Maybe God spoke to you about something today. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. And maybe you want to come talk to him about something tonight. Maybe you just want to thank him for his goodness. Amen. Maybe you want to lay some kind of burden down tonight. God's able. Maybe you'd like to come down this altar and say, God, take my life. Here I am, send me. I'm volunteering. My life. You know what I could say? His life for mine. Well, he gave it for us, didn't he? And we gave ours for him. My life.